Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. Or maybe Out of Our Depth. Oh, now you know. This week, a couple uh, studies have come out in the past few weeks that uh, seem to put a bad light on EVs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one which is a Swedish battery study, which is a metadata analysis study, right? So what is a metadata analysis, first of all? So basically, you're taking a bunch of data, and then you are taking that as data to run your study with. So you're not actually oh, generating you're... any data. Okay. You are simply taking data from other, other, studies. other studies. So your data depends on how good those other studies were. Right. So the more data you're sampling, the more chances that you're going to you know, maybe grab some not great data. So we got a lot of people who uh, emailed us that there was like this news in Breitbart or news on, you know, one of these websites that was like, EVs are dirty batteries. Um, so what, what did their, the Swedish study find? Well, so I think first we should cover what these stories were talking about. A lot of these news stories talked about how, oh, well, if EVs aren't good, then you should be driving your Ford F-150 pickup truck. Those liberal hippies don't know a damn thing about anything um, because of this one study that proves that they're wrong. Ha 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 ha. So this Swedish battery study said that a 100 kilowatt hour battery like you'd find in a Tesla could take eight years of driving the Tesla before it would cancel out all the energy and CO2 it took to build that battery to begin with. And so it was like, ha ha, you're driving this dirty car. Right. Which I will give credit. The, um, the writer of this study has basically said that a lot of these people are taking or a lot of these news outlets are taking his study out of context to say that, you know, these large battery electric cars aren't as good for the environment, saying that, you know, internal combustion engine cars would be better. He's saying that it's better to have a smaller battery pack than it is to have a larger battery pack, but that obviously electric cars are cleaner than than gas cars because gas cars never uh, pay themselves off CO2 wise because you're constantly pumping more uh, gasoline into them for them to burn and turn into CO2. So the guy who did the study knows that electric cars are better. His whole argument was basically that the bigger the battery, the worse it is for the environment. Right. I wrote to him um, and he wrote back and responded with a paper they had to come out with to explain their findings because so many people were misquoting it and making bad assumptions off of it. So first of all, one of their assumptions they had to make because the data they studied used these assumptions was that 50 to 70 percent of the electricity used to make the battery came from fossil fuels. That was the assumption they had to make based on the, the studies they studied. Right. What we want to point out, we just did a calculation of the electricity that would be used in Nevada and California, which are the two states that Tesla operates, in April of 2017. So the latest data we could find mm -hmm. from the U.S. Department of Energy. What we found is that if you just plugged into the average grid in Nevada or California, you would be using 68.73% zero CO2 emission electricity. Right. So we're not talking about cleaner things we're talking about you're generating zero co2 you're not burning anything to make this stuff we're not including biomass we're not including uh natural gas right okay we're including only things that so we're talking about wind we're talking about um hydroelectric we're talking about nuclear 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 we're talking about solar so 68.73 percent of your electricity in nevada and california comes from those sources right that is 50% or more cleaner than the assumptions they made in this study. So right, right off the bat, they're talking about it taking eight years would be off by about four years. Right. And I mean, this is because he's doing a much more general study. Um, he's talking about all car brands, whereas Tesla is very committed to making sure that their batteries are more sustainable, more sustainably sourced. Yeah. So another thing I want to point out is that Elon Musk has said his goal is for the Gigafactory to be 100% renewable energy. Right. He's going to cover it with solar panels. He's going to put solar panels on the hill to the side. He's going to make There's it going to be geothermal right. around. I mean, it's going to be as energy efficient and renewable as possible. So these assumptions that you make in terms of the energy that you have to use to produce these batteries is going to be pretty moot because it's all going to, going to be renewable, which is a great reason to go for Tesla because... Right. And so once renewable. you go to a completely renewable source of energy to make your batteries, your batteries are not producing any CO2 when you make them. I want to point out that one of the study writers, Halzinger Marzola, he got back to me and he wrote, the text you refer to is partly brought out of context. And so he provided us with 
more of this follow-up data so that we could point out to you that a lot of these stories were just cherry picking stuff out of his report to say, ha ha, Tesla batteries are dirty. A couple findings that he makes in the report. One we agree with, one we don't. Mm -hmm. So the first one says, a first step should be to require vehicle manufacturers to produce so-called environmental product declarations for electric vehicles and to include life cycle analysis data from the manufacturing process. I think you should go one step further and do this for ICE cars or any car that All you cars, make. All cars, right. All cars, so that we can have apples to apples comparisons. You go into a showroom, you look at the sticker, and it could say, you know, just like when you buy an air conditioner or refrigerator, and it says, this is, you know, from zero to 10, this is how efficient it is. Same thing should be for cars. It should tell you what the CO2 um, production content was to make that car. Right, so you draw a little bar, and you say, this is what it is, and then it says, after 10 years, this is how much um, you know, energy you're using or, or CO2, but be very specific on how you're calculating that right. CO2, because if you were to plug it into a solar panel, you're producing no CO2. So that's the first step. And we agree with that. The second point that he makes, I don't quite agree with. He says electric cars with large batteries should not be favored over those with smaller ones. Now it seems on its face to make sense. Oh, of course, just choose a car with the smallest battery possible. But here's the thing. A Leaf, which can go, say, 84 miles, mm -hmm. has a smaller battery than a Tesla 100 that can go, you know, 300 miles. Right. If you need more miles, then you need more miles. That's true. And so I guess my argument is, yes, a Leaf f can work for many people, and maybe it can work for you, let's say, 95% of the time. But that other 5% of the time, what are you going to do? You need to pick up your parents at the airport, and your Leaf won't make it there and back. Do you have to then get a taxi? Do you then have right. to borrow your friend's car? So if it's not going to work for you, then... If it doesn't work for you 100% of the time, then it simply won't work. I, okay, I'll preface that 99.9% .9 of the time. I mean, sometimes you need someone with a pickup truck to help you move or something. But, right. you know, obviously in the future, hopefully we'll have electric pickup trucks to help you move. The point I want to make here is that I don't think that the Tesla 100D battery pack is too big. I think that that's a pretty reasonable size for a battery pack. You get, you know, 350 miles. That's roughly what you get on a gas tank. I think that's pretty fair. Right. You, it's pretty rare that you're going to be driving more than that in a day, and then you have the superchargers to help you with that. But a Leaf, you can easily run out of battery during the course of a day, and you need to charge. I would agree with him if we were talking about a 500 kilowatt hour battery pack for for a normal car where you're going to get some ridiculous range like 800 miles and i mean some people have said you know i'm not going to get an electric car until it has a range of 800 miles and it's like you do not need that much range it, especially the, with the supercharger especially with the supercharger network the people have to want the cars and use the cars and if they're not going to buy the cars because i mean the leaf has been out for years and years and years and people have bought them but mostly they're people who care about the environment and we need to make sure that it's not just people who only care about the environment. We want people who would like more acceleration, would like, you know, bring people into it, make it something where everyone can use, everyone can use it. And it's not such a hassle. Other thing is you're not factoring in is that you're just talking about an EV battery. Well, if you're going to compare apples to apples, compa compare the EV battery to an ICE car, um, their powertrain and, and how they get their power. Once you've built the battery on a Tesla, that's it for CO2 production in, until you count the, the electricity going in, and that's getting cleaner every year. With an ICE car, you have to keep putting gas into that tank, right. and that isn't getting cleaner every year. Right. So you had to count that, and you didn't. So don't just say your Ford 150 is better because of this one study. You didn't count everything. Right. Also, you didn't count the fact that you can recycle the Tesla battery. You can take the cobalt, you Absolutely can take the true. nickel, you can take the lithium and reuse it again and again. Yep. You can't do that with an ICE car because once you burn that gasoline, you cannot recycle it. It's gone. That is the first big study that came out. The second one that came out recently is the Koch brothers have an anti-EV campaign. Uh, it's funded by Fueling US Ford and they cite an Arthur D. Little study that claims that EVs are dirtier than conventional cars. Now, what I really hate about this is the video they put out with it. And here you can see these poor little children, mainly in Africa and the Congo, that are mining for cobalt. Um, and this is claiming that this cobalt that these little kids are mining are going into your EV batteries. Shame on you. Tesla has said that their goal is to get all their cobalt from the US. Mm -hmm. now, from North America. From North America. Now, at this point, there's not enough cobalt mining going on in the US to provide them with that. But it's good to see that that's their goal and that that's what they're hoping to do. 
Also, I'd like to point out that Tesla is trying to get as much cobalt out of their batteries as possible and find other minerals that will work. Right. And that they're also, that cobalt is 100% recyclable. And so that once a Tesla battery has been fully used, you can recycle it and use it again. Right. The Union of Concerned Scientists has debunked this Arthur D. Little study. The Arthur D. Little study was inflating their emissions estimates by 40% uh, by accounting for battery replacement without recycling and adding the need for a replacement gasoline car with the EV. So the study itself is flawed. Mm -hmm. And again, this is what you know the Koch brothers and others are going to do. They're going to jump onto a study that's flawed. They're going to pull out their little cherry pick data. They're going to add some pictures of kids. And then they're going to go, you awful EV drivers. This is all debunked. This is all not true. But they're hoping that people will grasp onto that and, and it'll reaffirm their feeling of like, oh, I knew I was right about EVs being bad. Right. Let me get back in my Ford F-150 pickup truck and blast down the highway in it because I just feel so good to be so driving this. If you want to feel so good about yourself, how about pictures like this that are showing where your fuel source comes from? Because your fuel comes from oil out of the ground. You have to pipe it and there are explosions and there are leaks that poison people's water supplies. There are explosions that kill people. There are wars that are fought over it. And all of that has to be factored in if you're going to factor in your ICE car. So again, don't just cherry pick your data, compare apples to apples. If you're gonna cherry pick data from that Arthur D. Little study, then you should also count other studies that show what's going wrong with ICE cars. So for instance, here's a study from Swiss Research Institute, EMPA, uh, which counts the soot from direct injection gas engines. Which they are normal Normal engines. engines. Um, but basically, this is the new way that gas engines work, right? We, in, instead of a carburetor, we now inject gasoline because we can control it and we can reduce CO2 emissions from a car and increase fuel economy. But what we don't seem to count until this study has come out is that there's other things that come out of the tailpipe besides CO2. Right. And those things include soot or fine particles that get into your body. And then once they're in your body, they never leave your body. So right. what they did in this study, they took seven gas vehicles that were equipped with direct fuel injection systems. And they found that they emit from 10 to 100 times more particulates. Those are those little particles than modern diesel engines. Diesel engines. So we're comparing those to diesel, which we already know are not great. These are more, in fact, than older diesel engines that had no particulate filters. Wow. So here's a quote from one of the study writers. Uh, Once inhaled, these particulates remain in the body forever. That is from Norbert Hebe, who's one of the project leaders. Evidence shows that they can penetrate the membrane of your air sacs in your lungs and get into the bloodstream, and it gets worse. Liquid or solid chemical toxins from the combustion process accumulate on the surface of the particulates, which can then smuggle these substances into the bloodstream like a Trojan horse. Ugh. And that's not just diesel engine cars. That's not just... We're talking about gas engine cars. All gas engine cars. Right. They all produce particulates. And we seem to think, oh, it came out the tailpipe and now they're in the atmosphere, but I can't see them. So great. Well, it's not great. You're breathing them. Those nasty combustion products include benzo-A-pyrene, which is a known carcinogenic, and it's found in cigarette smoke. Wow. The World Health Organization considers even a tiny dose of benzo-A-pyrene harmful. Levels in vehicle exhausts were found to be as much as 1,700 times above the safe limit established in the EU. So that's what's going on right now with gas cars. Right. And we, why, isn't the, why aren't the Koch brothers citing these studies? Because they produce oil and they produce gas and they don't right. want to tell you about that. And they're constantly, constantly going to be coming out with, with studies that are going to be damning EVs, that are going to be saying, oh, see, EVs are bad. I told you so the whole time. We knew it. They're not going to be coming out with studies like these. And the reason that you're going to hear the anti-EV studies more than you're going to hear the anti-gas studies is because who has more money? Right. The people who are selling the oil. Right. Yeah, so let's talk about another study that came out in The Guardian. Professor Sir David King, who's the chief scientific advisor for the English government, he warns that levels of air pollution are often far higher inside of cars than outside of them. And that's really interesting. So basically, if you're a bicyclist, it's safer, the air is safer for you to breathe than it is if you are a child in the back seat of a car. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with how cars are designed. You have a tailpipe in the back because okay. you want to get rid of that stuff. That stuff's gross. Right. You don't want to put it in front of your no. car. No, 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 no. You're going to put it behind your car. Right. And, and then gone from right. And then you want to suck in air for you to breathe from the front of the car. Oh, that's all clean. Perfect. Perfect. Except if you are behind a similarly made car. 
with the exhaust in the back because then... Well, that never happens, though. Because then the exhaust from that car the, is going straight into your but car. But that never happens in car commercials. All I see are cars driving on clear, open roads. Right. But most of the time, you're going to be stuck in traffic behind a car with a tailpipe, which is basically right next to your So you're air sucking intake. in all that air, and then it recirculates it over and over and over again in the cabin. Yes. Gotcha. Or how about this study? Mm -hmm. The IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund. Their study of energy subsidies found that in 2015, the total global subsidies for energy was $5.3 trillion. Wow. Just to put that in perspective, that's 6.5% of the total amount of value of the goods and services produced in the entire world. 6.5% of it was spent to subsidize energy. oil. Right. So all these times that you hear about, oh, they're subsidizing solar, they're subsidizing electric cars. Yes, they are. There are incentives for those things, and those do come from the government. But most of it goes to oil and gas and coal. And so we don't hear about that, but that's just the facts, people. And so if you're going to cite these little cherry-picked pieces of studies that you pull out of the, of the internet, please, please also include the other facts which don't help your case. That's our little rant here this week. We get these studies that are sent to us every week, like, hey, what do you guys think of this? Yes, you're gonna keep hearing about those um, because they're gonna continually look for anything that they can do to claw their way back from fall. The, the technology is falling. This is just like what horse cart manufacturers were probably doing back in the 1900s. Like, oh no, we're losing market share to those new gas powered vehicles. That's just what happens when technology comes along. Right. This technology is better than that technology. It's cleaner than their technology. Right. And, and in many ways, it's better in terms of yeah. performance and safety. So I think it's very important for whenever you hear one of these studies, it's very easy to immediately sort of be like, oh, no, I knew it. I knew I was wrong. And I think you just you can't feel that way. You have to take this every study that you hear, whether it's positive or negative, with a grain of salt, you need to look at the study. You need to see, you need read, to use your brain. Yes, read the study. You need to study. look at it and say, is this right? Are they making the proper assumptions? Who's paying for the study? Who's paying for the study? Where did the data come from? Right. Because a Do lot a of times research. they'll use old data and they'll mix old data with some new thing to try and put together some new little fact that's that's damning to the, you know, to the electric cars. Right. If you take energy data, like power generation data from 10 years ago, it's completely different. The grid is completely different. It's getting cleaner every month. Right. We keep adding more wind. We keep phasing out more coal. Um, in the meantime, there seems to be a huge bubble of natural gas, but I think that will, that'll pass like all gas. <laughs> um, and soon we'll move to cleaner and more renewable sources of energy. So we hope that this has been a, a useful, helpful in depth for you. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, hope you tune in tomorrow for Tesla time news. There's lots of exciting news. Please consider subscribing. Uh, please consider liking and please consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps allow us to spend the time that we need to to bring you the up-to-date latest news debunk all of the you know oil bs and thank you again just so much for watching yeah and thank you and please share these videos if you can on your social media this is a great way to let other people know in your group that this is what's actually happening out there not just the the, the media that tells people things that aren't really true all right thank you so much for watching now you know, now you know.